Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 117. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis sitting in the captain's chair. Somehow they put me in the captain's chair on this one. I'm not sure why. Well, you put him on the schedule. Uh, I did, but you so know, that it's means all... means you well, get to be Well, more importantly, the Martin put him in Trello, so... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. You, you have the ability to override any of that at any mm-hmm. time that you wanted to. But uh, this is one we've talked about doing for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there's a, a tie to uh, our activities... Sure. Because this ties to our road trip. Yes, yes. So, that's right. Awesome road trip. Yes. Very so this much so. Has all been in the planning for quite some time. Right. Well, we knew that Lincoln, Lincoln was, if you love history, if you love American history in particular, you have to jump through the hoop that is Lincoln to do true justice to American history. He's just, you could arguably say, and we had this conversation in one of our, as we were doing some show prep before, he might be the most important American that there ever was. No, that's, it's arguable in certain ways. Washington certain ranks, certainly ranks right yeah. up there. Like, like we said during the quote <coughs> episode, um, you know, Washington wrote the check and Lincoln cashed it. Yeah, and you made that up. Am I right? That's right. So we want to make sure that... Or you cribbed that from somebody. Just, no, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's out of the blue inspiration. Right, well, yeah. Kind yeah. of like my uh, filling the Wilson piñata and hitting it with a stick. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. That's right. You know, uh, Martin, he's just... That's he's, a Martinism He's just, sure. yeah, yes. a wordsmith when he wants to be. That's Misfit correct. youth. That's right. But Lincoln, yeah, we, we have to we had to do an episode on Lincoln, and yeah, he should be uh, one of our heroes because he certainly is. Uh, and so much has been written about him. We were talking in the show, but how in the world can we possibly do an hour or so <laughs> and do this man justice? <clears throat> Why are you guys both looking at me? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> the hammer, I suppose. You know, you usually uh, you usually have the, uh, have the no. I just moment. paused to, to clear my throat. Apparently, at the wrong time. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> we well, well. thought you had something to say, so we, well, we, you know. Go ahead. Well, the only, my only thought to that was, my God, we say that every time we get together. How are we possibly going to do an hour on this? Whether it's we don't have enough material to fill, or how can we possibly limit it to an hour? That's that's for so, some truth to that. So yes. you know, I think it's just as a given. Just, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Yeah, that's right. We always so, come through. Ceteris paribus, we will always be able to get our hour in, that's, or less. That's exactly right. Well, the good thing about Lincoln is. There's been so much written about him, both by himself, because most of his writings still survive. And again, well, we but he didn't write a whole lot about himself. He that's correct. He wrote three biographical pieces about himself. The first was basically, uh, I was born from poor parents. Yeah. And that was for his first <laughs> announcement for running for office. The second one uh, was longer, and that was about uh, 3,000 words, which is a fair amount. Yeah. That's about three full typewritten <coughs> pages in today's... Yeah, uh, and, and I mean it's a lot for him, not a lot as far as the book goes. Yeah, and I've not actually gotten to the third one yet, but he he did not care to write much about himself because he was one of the most humble men yes ever. I Very mean, he so. had yes. humility down. Uh, there's a great quote in uh, uh, the the book that I'm reading uh, by uh, Ronald C. White. Usually, it's one of you guys that references the books. And we're glad yeah, you brought it. Yeah. And, and this is me. So it's a Lincoln. Um, by Ronald C. White Jr., which is and kind of the super duper number one bio right now, right? Yes, it is. It's it's kind of the most modern. Uh, you know, every every few years, a good scholar will come out with a particular biography on certain historical individuals. Ron Chernow did one on Grant, Hamilton, and Washington. Uh, but White here has kind of like yeah. been the guy on. Uh, the it's most a good recent. read. Yeah. It's uh, it's solid. There's not a whole lot of. Um, uh, uh, of uh, deification kind of biography, yeah. uh, hagiography. Uh, it, it's just a, he was, it even goes back to his ancestors when they came to this country. Um, Something that Lincoln himself did never knew in his life. Right, he, uh, he did not know. And traces them forward uh, in time. And I'm only about 60 pages into it, but I'm really liking it because it's just fascinating little bits and uh, recognizing in his early life the same life that I've traced in my own ancestors. How about that? Uh, it, it's fascinating because it followed a very similar path. His ancestors came over, uh, and they came over to some fair amount of wealth and land. Mm-hmm. Well, land was wealth. Yeah. Uh, but each successive generation had wanderlust, and they kept moving around. And basically, by the time Lincoln comes, well, by the time Lincoln's uh, grandfather comes around, you know, they're uh, relatively poor farmers. Uh, here in Kentucky, mm-hmm. and they they didn't have a lot. You know, they they were 
subsistence farmers, I guess is what you would call yeah. them. Right. Well, and the father lost some land because a lot of title problems. Yes. There wasn't always clear That's title. one of the reasons they ended up in Indiana. Apparently yeah. Indiana had better uh, yeah. uh, ch- uh, title law. And it was very common in Kentucky for titles to be just... People have to buy the, the land multiple times just to get clear titles and people losing it uh, in court on a whim. It's just horrible, horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's you think we were Arkansas or something. Huh. Uh, <clears throat> no offense to those of you in Arkansas. So but, uh, you're right. Uh, that is, uh, they end up in Indiana because they can actually get title to some land and keep it. Right. And even though they, uh, the, the family got relatively poor with succeeding generations, they always were tied to land. They always owned the property they farmed. Right. Yeah. They, they were not tenant farmers or anything like that. But anyways, so talking about his humility, uh, every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I cannot. I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. I love that quote. I love that. That's right. <laughs> because it, it's a it's a very wordy and flowery way of saying, uh, you know, my entire goal is just to be a good man. That's right. Yeah. And worthy uh, of right. admiration by others to, for being a good To both man. be seen as one and to be one. Yeah. yeah. And that was certainly, that was some, Lincoln had a moral compass to him. Uh, there was a pragmatist to him, very much oh, yes. so. He recognized you can only do what you can only do. Well, that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about his, you know, his growing up. We talked about some of it. Born here in Kentucky, uh, Hodgensville, Kentucky. Uh, they have a replica. In, uh, we live not far from Hodgensville. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, you can go there to his birthplace, uh, National National Park, and uh, I've been there. Yeah, I should say. I, I think we've all been there. Oh, it's been years, but yeah, yes. yeah, it's been years. That's, for that's me. kind of a thing you do as a kid here. You you got to go down to see the the Lincoln. Yeah, birthplace. which is basically what uh, what the the great comedian and philosopher Tim Wilson called a limb cabin, not a log, <laughs> log cabin. cabin. That's right. He said that the dirt floor would have lasted about 10 minutes in his house. Well, you know, but that was common. Everybody had a dirt floor that's unless correct. you were really rich. Well, or Lincoln always, and again, I, we talked a little bit about, I may be getting my stories a little confused here, but Lincoln had always talked about, he, he, never, he had not thought, as I recall this, the, the guy's disputing on this, he didn't have a good relationship with his father, and he... Well, we don't dispute like that part. Right. But what, how, how deep that was, it, it may be... How deep the animosity went. Right, exactly. Because when, uh, when his father, you know, Lincoln's mother dies uh, when he's a, is, he's a young man. Yeah. And he was extremely... No, not a young man. A, a young child. boy. Yeah, yeah a young he boy. was eight. I yeah, know, I, I, like I want to say eight or nine. And, uh, and he, uh, he was very, <coughs> very close to his mother. Uh, he made, and I do know this comment, he said, anything that was ever at all good in me came from her. Yes. He, he literally uh, you know, almost worshipped his mother. She, uh, she, I don't want to say she coddled him, she taught him. His love of reading and education came directly from her. His father cared nothing about such things. Uh, his father, uh, uh, Lincoln did have one sister who, who died, who died, as well, who died yes. early on. Uh, as a young lady, I believe she was recently married and died of. Uh, yeah, she died in childbirth. In childbirth. So childbirth. childbirth. I remember right. Like, his mother died of what was called a milk sickness, which is kind of not really sure what that was. Well, I, poisoning. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Ron, Ron White talks about that. Yeah. Apparently, there's been cows some were, were yeah. eating poisoned plants. Yes, snake root. And it was snake root. Yes, and it was poisoning the milk. Yeah. That they were giving, and so people who drank the milk would then die. Right. And so it was just. You know, one of those things that it took a while to figure out. Right. Yeah, and it's something that cause Lincoln himself never really understood it in his lifetime. Mm-hmm. And if you if you ever, of course, read uh, the book uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> which actually was not a it was it was a fun little riff off of that. Uh, she was killed by a vampire, actually, and that's why he became a vampire hunter. <laughs> but we're, we're sliding off that. Right. It wasn't a bad movie. It was stupid as hell, but it was still a Yeah, movie. well, you know, it's one of those movies that's so stupid it can be fun. That's kind of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the things, like I said, I was talking about earlier about the parallel with my own uh, uh, family, my, my scaf ancestors that came to this country, uh, that wanderlust and that moving around. And I think... Lincoln and his father, Thomas, were very similar in many ways. Mm -hmm. And that is that Lincoln got that wanderlust from his father, definitely, because he moved around quite a bit as an adult. He was up and down the river, uh, Mississippi River, several times. Uh, As young men were wont to do when they were out on their own, they actually lived with other people, uh, Mm -hmm. families. 
They'd stay here a little while, then move on to the next family, just doing chores to earn their, their place to sleep and a little right. bit of food. And he worked on lots of different jobs, but through it all, uh, this 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 uh, drive to to do something. Yeah, you know, he was not a lazy man by not any stretch. No. Uh, he was always working, doing something, mm -hmm. and always willing to learn something new. Yeah, the, the idea of him, uh, the image of him as the rail splitter that they used in the uh, 1860 campaign was a reality. He did do that. Oh, absolutely. That, uh, and of course, he, he milked it for all he could get it for. It made a good image, but that was that was exactly the type but that, of... That is part of how he differed from his father. His yes. father was more of a kind of farmer, jack-of-all-trades, do this, do that, whatever the town needed, a little carpentry work, a little right. of this, a little of that. And he kind of scorned Abe for... Reading, all the reading, time. sitting around. He's kind of a dreamer, sitting around. It's just a different kind of work, right? You know, there's value to both, obviously. Um, but it, it, that's well, I when you're trying I, to clear a field to plant the crop, you kind of need him to put yeah. down the book and come on. But right. yeah, um, you know, so I, 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 just, I find that dichotomy interesting as well. Yeah. Uh, well we've talked about the nature of, of work and every, and all that in the past, yeah, right. and action versus thought. So it's interesting that the different ideas of action uh, inherent in, in those difficulties. Yeah, because Lincoln was by you know he was one of the he was a workaholic president as we as we well yeah. know. I many were. Yeah. Uh, but of course he had reason to be for, that were that were different. Than many but of even as a, as a young country <coughs> lawyer in Springfield, he was a busy fellow. Yeah, he rode he, the circuit. Uh, he put in the effort yeah, he as, did. as a lawyer. And a uh, lot of that happened, that wanderlust that you mentioned here, once he meets Mary Todd, that kind of, she is definitely not that type, and she ain't putting up with that shit anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, she, her, <laughs> you know, that's not unlike his, his own stepmother. That's correct, uh, you yes. Know, not that Thomas Lincoln didn't move around after he got married, yeah. but when she came into the, the, the family, you know, she brought her own kids. Right. Because she was previously married mm -hmm. as well. And it was one of those marriages of, second marriages of convenience, yeah. as they often are. Right. Frontier yeah. marriages are like that. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, but they, it was Gotta successful. have a woman in the it, house. It was successful by it all, was. By all uh, records. And that. she came in, she was, pra she was practically a, a tour de force on her own, because she came in, took control of that household, or that yeah. cabin hold, <laughs> and... You know, got those boys, young men, and, and you know and, and the adult and the and the, the boys, and got them straightened out because they were living as bachelors. Think about that. That's right. On the frontier, that place had to have stunk to high heaven. Well, that's correct. And, and the, you know, she was that dirt heaven. floor didn't last no time. That was a real wooden <laughs> floor put down as yeah, soon as she quit came. Tracking in. in the outside dirt to my inside dirt. That's, that's right. exactly right. Got to keep the inside and the outside dirt separate. That's right. She uh, fixed that, but you quickly. know, that's right. And you know, she made him make real furniture and things right. like that because that was one of the things that when they moved out of Kentucky to Indiana, they left all the furniture behind because he was just going to make new. Right. Sure when they got there, and they didn't want to have to, to cart that with them, right? Because that actually cost money going across the river. You know how much stuff you had to ferry was was a cost. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that you know is not unlike uh, Mary Todd in that you know she solved some of that wanderlust for him. Whether that be because she said, "No way in hell, I'm dragging my butt all over God's green earth," yeah. or he was just willing to stay where she was. To begin with, you know, their either way, yeah. their marriage was a was a strange affair all in all. She was not his first love. I mean, he no. actually they almost got married to a young lady uh, there when he was early on in uh, Springfield, and she dies. And it was Anne Rutledge. Right? Anne Rutledge, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot written about that. And so there's been tons and tons and tons of speculation about what the true feelings and what all that happened with that. And, uh, but I do know that his, his good close friend Joshua Speed, who is probably his best friend, I would say, they went into business together uh, there in the store business, and uh, he, he lived with Speed for a while. Speed's family was wealthy. They're from here in, in Louisville. The whole Farmington uh, plantation, well, it's not plantation, but the, I guess the whole house and uh, mm -hmm. area, that was his family. Yes. This Joshua Speed related to the J.B. Speed? It is. Yes. That is correct, yes. So and uh, he was extremely wealthy, and uh, Lincoln would spend some but time... But not necessarily very good at business. No, no, he was not, but his, his family was wealthy. Joshua yes. Speed, not so much himself. Well, as the biography that I was reading puts it, basically, the downfall was uh, their vices. Uh, Lincoln liked to talk to the customers too much. Yeah. Didn't uh -huh. pay enough attention to the ledger. 
And Speed liked to drink a little too much, and once they started selling alcohol, that was it. That was it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. And, and that was a, that was one of those moments, you know, Lincoln, like Grant had done. He, they were both they were both storekeepers that failed at this terrible at this right. business. Well, that was a good uh, middle class. Yeah. You know, before that term really becomes defined, that was a good middle class uh, uh, route to go between being a farmer. Mm-hmm. Or being a, a storekeeper, you know, yeah. You know, well, no, or between being a farmer or being someone who was born into money, yeah. You know, that's the the merchant class, right? You because you could make a, a fortune there, right? If you did it well, uh, that was not Lincoln's trade, and it was soon. At, and Lincoln goes back after Anne Rutledge's death and spends some time at, at Farmington here uh, with Speed, not knowing what he's going to do in life, and he almost committed suicide. It's One thing to, to talked to, about to point out because you're going to talk about honest Abe, yeah, because right? that's important. Uh, and how humble the man was, they ended up seriously in debt. Uh-huh. Lincoln, instead of like most merchants would have done, which is run out of town in the middle of the night, yeah. he stayed and paid off the debt. Right. And that's important. That shows the character of the man. Very much so. Uh, that he, yeah. he refused yeah. to just leave somebody holding the bag for their mistakes. That's right. Uh, that That's important. That's right. Because he knew that his reputation, it mattered to him. Uh, he, he still well, had to build to that. to be esteemed by other men. That's exactly right. I mean, that's that's what, that sums it, it up. It mattered to him that, that he did that. Uh, and it was uh, shortly after his time of dark night, as it were, when he was with Speed. Uh, he, he moved, they're, they're in Illinois. He meets uh, Mary Todd, who was from wealth herself, uh, mm-hmm. Lexington, Kentucky, slave-owning family, but they were very wealthy. And... Uh, Whatever he saw in her, he came up to her and famously said, I want to dance with you in the worst way. Uh, she had other suitors, and eventually she settled on him. And, of course, the rest is history. She was a pistol, and she, uh, that's putting it politely. Uh, you know, it's often said behind so many great men are wonderful wives. I don't know that that applies so much here, although she did drive him in many ways. She was, in many respects, a cross that he bared. Uh, you know, the, the well, yeah, in the White House, definitely, because yeah. you know she had her mental uh, health issues. Right, and some of it is understandable. Some of it, I don't know. But the, the, there's famous stories of her chasing Lincoln down the streets of Springfield with a rolling pin, and him having to tell her, "Mary, let's go inside." You know, this is something that was public, so that was kind of talked about in years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, they have four children. Uh, uh, all of but one of which predecease her. Yeah. Two of which predecease Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, and there's no question that as a mother, if you want to trace so much of Mary Todd's downward spiral, those are yeah, pinch points. That's, that definitely. Yes. Is. She she always had the ability. They lost one son before the White little, House. Little Eddie was uh, he was three years old. They were still in Springfield. Yes. He was very small. Uh, and after that, it was Robert. Eddie, who passes away at three, and then Willie and Tad. Willie and Tad were hellions uh, in the White House in particular, because they were still boys. Yes. And Lincoln was notorious for not disciplining, disciplining his children. Yeah. And he, he deliberately says that all the time. He says, I'm not just not going to do that. I didn't like to do that. I didn't like to be disciplined. It goes back to those daddy issues again. <laughs> uh, I, I want these boys to love me. I want to love them. I want to have t- fun with them, and I want them to have fun. And that's just kind of... The way things well, worked. His really, law office was that way. Yeah, and, that was presented in the museum in Springfield. Exactly. I mean, in, it was in the law office, they played baseball with the inkwells. That's right. Which had to been a hell of a mess. Well, uh, Lincoln's law partner Herndon uh, often it was frustrating to him, but they were good friends. Yeah. And Lincoln was very, very good at what he did, uh, riding the circuit, not making a lot of money, mind you, but right. but it was it was an honest living. And Lincoln discovered he was self educated that he well, had also, talent for it. It also got him into, uh, uh, you know, today, being a lawyer is your, your entry into politics. Uh, really, probably politics is how he ended up getting into the law. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, he, was, he had that, he was outgoing in the sense that he liked to talk to people. He liked right. to talk to people about ideas. Mm-hmm. And yes. uh, you know, it used to be as a, as a child, he would uh, give sermons that he heard in church verbatim to his friends. You know, get up on a stump. Uh, or a soapbox, what we call a soapbox today, and repeat them. And I'm sure his friends just loved that. It's like, wasn't bad enough I had to sit through this the first time, now i got to listen to Abe do it. That's right. Uh, but, you know, he could remember that and, and give it back. And yeah, yeah, he, had, he, he just had a, loved to talk about the issues of the day as well. Mm-hmm. And he, he wasn't in uh, the, the the first time he settled in Sanger for, uh, I think, less than a year. And... They nominate him to run for Congress for the local state legislature. Right. Rather, he loses that one, wins the second time he does. Right. And you know, 
it's all because he likes to talk. He likes to talk about the yeah. issues. And people salons genuinely were like him, yes. Yeah, they call them debating societies, but as you know, Europe, Europe would call them salons. Right. And it's basically doing what we do. Right. Yeah. Getting around and talking about stuff. Yeah, that's right. And there's there's two really huge moments for him politically. He does win a race mm-hmm. for the U.S. Congress. Mm-hmm. He's a Whig. He's a Henry Clay admirer. Right. Yes, uh, big fan of Henry Clay. So right. he's, he's very much in this... Um, you know, use the tariff for improvements, mm-hmm. uh, financial administration, kind of that sort of reaching back to that Alexander Hamilton sort yes, of... Yes, wanted a central bank. A central right, bank, yeah. merchant a- class type thing. Um, and has a fairly successful one term. Uh, he only runs, I think, the one time. Uh, and Because and, he promised, I think, to just spend the one term up and hand it over to somebody else. But he was, I think, Illinois' only Whig uh, mm-hmm. in their delegation. And, and, you know, he comes back and is well thought of after coming back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the biggie, though, is deciding to run for Senate. That's right. Which he loses. He loses to Stephen Douglas, but the debates That's correct. were a big deal. They are still reproduced even today right. uh, over and over yes. again. Uh, you can, C-SPAN has run them for peri- periodically. They'll have... Uh, uh, reenactors that look like Douglas and Lincoln that have memorized these speeches, mind you, mm-hmm. and give the same ones. And it What's was, interesting is Lincoln, uh, you know, he's the loser in the election, mm-hmm. and presumably because he's, you know, became, went out and became president. It's called the, it's always the Lincoln Douglas debates, mm-hmm. never the <laughs> Douglas Lincoln debates. That's right, so, yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and very crucially, I mean, they, these were not just about anything. Right. This these was were slavery. Slavery. Absolutely. And, period. And Lincoln was arguing against. Slavery, right? Very publicly, very eloquently too. Uh, and but publicly is the big key. That's correct. I mean, he's, because he was seen as he's someone. A stand. He's taking a stand. So when he eventually runs for president against Douglas, mind you, you know, uh, who has very clearly staked out his own claim to be pro-slavery. The mm-hmm. South really likes him, even though he's an Illinois guy. They see that is somebody. That's who they want as president because he's going to continue slavery. And allowed to expand. And Lincoln, even though he has not gone on record when he runs as being an abolitionist per se, he still is. He's very clear: we will not expand slavery into the new territories. Yeah. And that's what that's what hits it. And to be honest, it's not Lincoln's fault per se that that election was a referendum on slavery. It just so happened that the choices were very clear. And Lincoln himself, to be honest, yeah. I mean, should not have been nominated. Well, it's you know, it's the collapse of the Whig Party. That's correct. And the formation of this new Republican Party that is basically the ashes of the Whigs plus uh, anti-slavery people. Right. Bring, it, which, it's which the become anti-slavery the, Northern Whigs, which become the radical Republicans eventually. Uh, but the problem is, Lincoln runs against uh, several guys uh, for his own party that are regionalized out and can't get a majority. Uh, Salmon P. Chase from Ohio, uh, Seward from Ohio, and uh, and I cannot remember uh, the other guy from Missouri, uh, shoot me probably, uh, that they were the ones that all went together. And no, nobody could get a majority in that time. But Lincoln they could all agree on as being okay. Yeah. But he was their last choice, irony of ironies. But he's the one that they nominated. And his, pro, his anti-slavery... Uh, Breckenridge. Rec- uh, Breckenridge. Thank you. Yes, exactly. John C. Breckenridge. John C. Breckenridge. Who, ironically, who was the 1856 nominee? Correct. I think you may be right, sir. Uh, he, of course, was a, will become a Confederate general, uh, and I do believe he's the one that uh, Grant had surrendered to him, Fort Donelson. Or am I thinking of Vicksburg? No. No, no, Pemberton was Pemberton. Yes, Pemberton. right. Exactly. Uh, Breckenridge. Uh, Breckenridge was his relative. Uh, one, I, I may be wrong on that, but Larry, Mary Todd had uh, several brothers who fought for the Confederacy because her family was from Kentucky yeah. and were slave owners. Uh, so that you know, that's yet another thing. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves anyway. But uh, but Lincoln ends up winning the nomination and the presidency. Yeah, and it's because the 1860 election is like four different people, right? But Lincoln actually ends up out electoral voting all of them combined. That's right. Because, yes. uh, because doesn't just win by whisker, he crushes be, all three. That's right. Because of the Lincoln Douglas debates, which received national prominence, and I think 
were a cultural touchstone, particularly to people in the North, saying, wait a minute, this really does need to be about slavery. We're tired of this. And it was also a touchstone in the South saying, we're tired of listening to this shit. Stop <laughs> talking about it. So therein lies the two forces that would collide yeah. uh, upon, uh, which were inevitable, we could, we could say, sooner or later. Yeah, it was, uh, it was going to happen. Yeah, well, once, especially once the Missouri Compromise was exploded by Stephen Douglas, mind you. Kansas, Nebraska. Kansas, Nebraska Act. Act, correct. Things could have continued. Clay, for all his uh, uh, genius, should have. He, he, he desperately wanted to hold the Union together. By God, he did. Uh, he kicks this, this issue down the road yeah, kicked the can you know, for several the decades yeah. by, that, by that genius compromise. But I'm, and I'm not sure. And I don't want to speak for Henry Clay, but I'm thinking surely he genius had to re- compromise or you know insidious compromise. It depends on what side that you're on. That's yeah, correct. I mean that uh, that's one you know a, a good compromise is one where everybody walks away unhappy, uh, <laughs> depending, on, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, uh, certainly that's the way a lot of people approach it. Right, and I would say just about everybody walked away unhappy with that. One. That's right. But it kept the peace for until Stephen Douglas had to stick his vile racist fingers. I'm sorry. I'm, if you can't tell, I am definitely not, not a fan. Yeah, we're not. Nobody's a fan of Stephen Douglas much anymore. That's no, very much so. Uh, and uh, and not just because he uh, he ran against. Ironically, Lincoln losing was the best thing that ever happened to him because ultimately it saved the nation by that loss to Stephen Douglas because he had been a senator. Who knows? If he would have even run or been able to run, I don't know. But kind of doing a what if. But you know, let, let's talk about this just a little bit because you know, there's the old. Uh, uh, you guys have seen the. It's now it would be called a meme, but it's, you used to see it in emails and what have you. You know, he did. He, he he failed at this. He failed at this. He actually won an election here. Failed at this. Failed at this. Failed. At, you know, all these things. Right. And then at the end, he was elected president in 1860. You know, there is a good point to that. Meaning, how in the hell did this guy ever get? To the presidency. That's right. Because publicly, he really had no business being at the national level. He had failed at the national level, except for those debates, getting his name known. That's right. You know, nowadays, we would never elect a, as president somebody who had only served one term in Congress, had failed to win a seat in, Senate, in the Senate. That's right. And was practically a nobody, uh, as far as the national stage goes. In many respects, the gift of oratory can carry a whole lot of weight and that's well, at that time. Well, well, that's the thing. There's no sound bites. And Lincoln right. was excellent at using newspapers. Yeah. Yes. And he he used to, to uh, glad hand with the editors because they basically, you know, they controlled what went in and how it was slanted. Right. So he got a lot of favorable press. And, you know, back then you didn't do a whole lot of your own campaign. You yeah. had you had subordinates people to it. Because yeah, you, you, you couldn't be it. everywhere. And right. most newspapers... I mean, they had a slant at this time. They were pro-slavery newspapers or anti-slavery newspapers, and Lincoln made good copy in the anti-slavery newspapers. Which was in its ascendancy. You have uh, the the abolition movement is no longer considered to be fringe by this time. It's It's not John Brown anymore. It's come to be mainstream uh, in many people's eyes in the North, and that's kind of what brought the tipping point. It was just public opinion being what it was. And this is a baby party. Yeah. To be, I mean, that's true too. It's, it's just starting out, so you're like, well, they don't have any baggage. Yeah, there's, but when you're gathering, that's around kind of your them, baggage, though, that you don't have. You any don't baggage. have any. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah that's right. right. No mm-hmm. record, no nothing to build on. So you're making it up as you go a bit. Again, you're taking the ashes of this Whig party and this mercantilism, and then you're grafting on this anti-slavery position, which the Whigs would never have touched. No, they did not. Well, they didn't want to touch it in the in the same way. I mean, yeah, it was one of those officially, things that, they wouldn't yeah. they wouldn't sign you know, on. But to there it. were Southern Whigs and Absolutely. Northern Whigs, yeah. and again, so the, the, yeah, just as there were Northern Democrats and Southern the Democrats. Southern Southern Whigs eventually would drift out of, of the party, and that's kind of part of what fractured it. But then there's there's you're just making it up as you go, and you're trying to nominate somebody, and you're like. Well, I mean that that Sam and Chase man, he never shuts up, and then this guy owes me money, and yeah. so well, how about the, how about this guy from Illinois? Yeah, you can't he can't do you no harm. Yeah, uh, he's, he's kind of harmless. Let's run him. That's kind of way. Oh we're, wait, what he won? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait, there's like three other guys running. We've got a shot at this. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, because uh, uh, William Seward was uh, and Sam and Chase too. They thought it was theirs. 
Both of them. Oh, they thought he was a, a complete goon. That's right. And ironically, they also they would later become some of his greatest friends and supporters and members of his cabinet, mm-hmm. which uh, leads back to the my favorite book on Lincoln, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's Team of Rivals. Uh, it's not a full biography. It's about his time as the presidency, yeah. as we're kind of working yeah, our way Yeah, about there. the cabinet, because he's not, they're not, she's not kidding. They That's really right. felt, well, several of them felt they should have been the president, That's right. not him. And Lincoln had the wisdom to bring these guys, because they were the smartest guys in the room on their era, in, in their time. It's better to have them inside Absolutely. than have them outside causing trouble. That's right. <laughs> and go yeah. to newspaper editors. This way you're bringing them in, and you're using them. That's right. And, and making them feel part of... The decisions and sharing power in many ways because yeah. you know oh, yeah. uh, you know Secretary of State Seward it's a big position that's a big deal uh, Salmon Chase you know the Secretary of Treasury Stanton. big deal Stanton Secretary of War uh, I mean some of these guys we probably know very few cabinet positions other than those as general rule Americans very yeah. don't know very few cabinet positions unless they're the current ones or ones that we've lived through but many s- s- amateur historians can name Lincoln's cabinet or at least some of them. Because they were that important uh, for what happened, uh, which was kind of an amazing thing. Which I guess we should shift gears a little bit. Uh, before we get into the presidency more, should we take the bourbon break? I believe so. That's right. Call it. Uh, get, well, get it uh, Captain, do I what you can want. do that. Well, that's, that's true. That's true. Well, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I will give you a Lincoln story that concerns bourbon, believe it or not. I guarantee you it's apocryphal. But... Uh, uh, Lincoln was born in what was at the time Hardin County, Kentucky, uh, but it eventually became LaRue County, Kentucky later. Uh, and I was born one county over in Nelson County, which is uh, a wet, and LaRue County to this day is still dry. However, there were plenty of distilleries through there, even in the 1800s, one of which was owned by my great 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 grandfather on my mother's side, John Boone. Uh, no relation to Daniel. He was Pennsylvania Quaker. We were Maryland Catholics. But. Uh, John Moon, uh, in, in 1880, there was a uh, historical newspaper record printed, a little magazine that was printed. You still get copies of it today. And it talked about Lincoln and his Kentucky roots, and it said that John Boone was the distiller man who was near where Lincoln was a boy. And Lincoln's boyhood home is right there. Uh, and supposedly Thomas Lincoln worked for uh, uh, worked for John Boone for a period of time. It's possible. We don't know that. Uh, but supposedly John Boone saw young Abe and said, you know, that boy's going to amount to something one day. Which, of course, has got to be the most <laughs> bullshit smart for the state. Because uh, it's written 30 years after Lincoln is dead. Yeah, so yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. yeah, right. Come on, Well, guys. you know, where he grew up on that farm mm-hmm. uh, down there near E-Town, which is interesting. One thing I discovered, at the time his grandfather uh, was, was living there in his... Uh, Thomas, who was the youngest of the, the three three brothers, along with uh, Mordecai, and I'm blanking on the the, the eldest of the three brothers, but, uh, uh, you know, they grew corn primarily. Mm-hmm. And I imagine much of that corn became bourbon. Absolutely. So, it's the only way to move it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that is, so he does have his bourbon ties. Oh, absolutely. There's, there was quite a bit of that that was going on yeah, in the yeah. area. It was, it was a cheap and, and very, very uh, sold well. I mean, yes. Well, that's what he was taking on the flatboats. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because yeah, so. it was made uh, there. So anyway, anyways, in in Lincoln's honor, uh, I am having some irony of ironies, some Jim Beam Black Label, which is from Tennessee, I think. Sorry, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why did I'm thinking Jack Daniels? It's Jim Beam. That's a I would never allow anything that would dare call itself I, bourbon and be made I, in Tennessee. That's what I thought. I don't know why I had a brain aneurysm. So, yeah, there. Not, not to really like jump on you there or anything. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, Tennessee. No, be, we, be wrong. That's right. That's I mean, right. It's okay, but it was like it's not what we're doing. The record straight. We sit at the table. That's right. This is old Jim Beam. Tennessee here. That's right. This mm-hmm. is this is Kentucky Jim Beam Black Label uh, single single barrel made from Claremont, Kentucky, just a few miles right. away. Now here. this is not your regular you know low shelf. Correct. Yeah, and Jim Beam bourbon. And you know, I talked about it in the the last, last episode. episode. Yes, uh, I didn't well, have and, any then. And Martin did too. Right. And that's why I'm trying it this time because you guys were divided. And now you're having it neat. I'm correct? having it neat, and let All me right. make sure I okay. Take. So, what do you got? Woo. Uh, I'm probably on Robert's side here. It's got a a waft to it that fills the mouth and a little bit in the sinuses, but goes down well. It it's, doesn't linger. It here. does not linger. No, it does not, not, not terribly. Not uh, no, it is very very smooth. Now you are having yours with ice. You're having the same yeah, thing. I had it neat last time. Ice this time. 
So your opinion? And it, the ice, a little bit of melt in the water is mellowing it out some. So the uh, right, and I, I and I agree with you. I'm still getting a lot of that same, but it's it's more um, not harsh, but sharp. It's a, it's yeah, a bit sharp. Well, it's kind of like sharp cheese versus mild cheddar. And there's nothing wrong with either. It's just got a little bit more. Well, bulbous. I think I do prefer it with a little bit of chill and then just a splash of water. Uh, I think I like it better that way. Uh, this is perfectly fine. Don't get me wrong. This has got a little explosive quality to yeah. it when it goes in. There's a but I, boom. right. Uh, you know, unlike the Devil's Cut, for instance, where that that sharpness, that harshness lingers a lot more. Right. Right. It's this one is far more smooth. Down. You know, it's much more pat, especially the chilled with a little bit. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. of the water that that is so much smoother than even the neat version. This I find fascinating because you know we've not done a whole lot of experimentation with this. We each drink. Our Whatever. bourbon's the way we drink it. That's right. I tend to have mine with a cube of ice. I don't like a whole lot because I don't want a whole lot of water to melt it, uh, to dilute it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of why I Martin tends it to have it neat. Yeah. No, uh, well, no, I tend to do a little more ice than you. Oh, that's right. I'm he's, sorry. He, he's I'm the one that has it neat. Francis these days. is pretty much gone to completely, completely neat. neat. Right. right. I generally do four to five ice cubes. You kind of do one or two ice cubes. You just take a little edge off. I like the mellowness. Uh, of a little, uh, a little fresh water. Right. So you've even got more ice and, and, and now melted uh, ice in, in with uh-huh. uh, yours than I did last yes. night. It so. smoothed it out, gave it a little bit more sweetness. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it pulls the sweetness out when you mellow it out with a little water. So now but I'm very interested there. to go back and we need to redo all of our bourbon tastings <laughs> and reverse how we we've been drinking. Well, it. that's you know that you gives know, us do money. some comparisons. That gives us next time we money do a bourbon content. episode. Yes. That's what we need to do. We need to do. Try Let's, a couple neat and then try a couple with ice. Yeah. And, and, and then the, swap. And swap them around. Right. And, yeah. And, and yeah. see how that, that goes. Because I think, because again, you know, it was unexpected the difference between them. And because usually we are all in pretty much agreement. Yeah. On, we, we don't want to contradict. Yeah. We, uh, we may pick up a few different and I were things. very sharply divided last yeah, night. That is yeah. unusual. Usually yeah, yeah. We're, we I, can I must have just got maybe a bad first snort of that one or something. Well, you know, coming after the four roses, maybe it just paled in comparison. Well, that, no, that could be. That, that's a fair, fair point. You know, that small batch four roses was <laughs> that was, was even good. better than the I regular enjoyed, four yeah, roses. I enjoyed it very, very well. And this again, is, this that is stuff's like gravy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have some more, sir? <laughs> that's right. Absolutely, we still got plenty of balls. Um, um, you know, that's the, the thing I like about the, the four roses is such for for such a quality bourbon, mm-hmm. it is so reasonably priced. It's now I got that on point. sale. And when I bought it, I think it was still only like $27. That's, that's a great price point. Uh, uh, and for a small batch yeah. bourbon, a uh, great any, price any, Anything between $20 and $30 is great, yeah. yeah. Well, $20, $30, that's, to me, that's the beginning of your uh, your good sipping bourbons. It is. Yeah, uh, the, ten, the $10, 12 that's what you give to the in-laws. When they that's right. Over. That's what the drunk in-laws drink. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Uh, you know, you get that that really inexpensive four year bottled and bond stuff. That, uh, well, that's you know, correct. It's a fine mixing bourbon. Don't get me wrong. Well, I have a tendency to pour it into my crystal decanter with no label on it. What is that? Oh, that's some of the very best. That's you know, right. Of has, only the best. The government has certified this that's stuff. Right. Bottled in bond. I mean, we can go on and on. Yeah. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story, gentlemen. No, I know that absolutely. Yeah. So well, and that's that's a good segue into what would then. Become of Lincoln. Yes. Again, we don't want to. We know the presidential career, and we know the oratory uh, at Gettysburg, especially. But the, both the first and second inaugural addresses. Correct. Uh, especially the second with the, with malice towards none and charity towards all, and bind up the nation's wounds. This was not a man looking to punish people. No. And these words, obviously, the the addresses have lasted, of course, because you know people wrote that stuff down. And you have the original text. But those words have become part of the American lexicon. Yes. 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 That's an incredible and, and, thing. And not just because of being murdered, you know, two weeks later, but... No, because I think he, you know, he it, would it, definitely it, have fulfilled those promises. Yes. Correct. Uh, Reconstruction would have yes. been so much different. Yes. Yeah, one of the Lincoln. great, one of history's great what-ifs. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but the, the myth-making begins almost immediately. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a... You know, now he belongs to the ages yeah, set that's, over his that's deathbed. Just, yeah, that's that, uh, that that's kind of a real thing. I mean, he really, genuinely affected people that way. Right, uh, and the and the war was over at this point. I mean, he had yeah. he had you know, he'd done he, it. He had it's just like, as Saint Paul would say, he had run the race and kept the faith. Uh, he had managed to see this country through 
of its bloodiest conflict and come out unified, more or less, on the other side, at least officially. Yeah, he won the war. He was going to be able to save the Union. He won re-election, he too. Won re-election. Which is very important because it, it could have been... During his first term, there are people who says, well, he's, you know, the words like, not my president, things like that. You hear that all the time. You know, he, the, and especially in the South, you know, they would vilify him, burn him in effigy and all this sort of stuff. And yet, uh, his reelection was not well, even. Well, no votes close. got counted from the South. That's so right. It's yes. a lot easier to win. <laughs> well, that's correct. Right. But, uh, but, you know, uh, I mean, I mean the, the Northern Democrats were, you know, they, they, they thought they had really pulled a fast one having McClellan. That's right. Yeah. They thought they would win the Army's vote well, with McClellan. If but the soldier, the common soldier said no. Overwhelmingly voted no, Lincoln. No, we, we, we know what we're in here. We're up to our hips in blood and guts, and it's going to mean something. We're voting for Abe. The thing, the thing about McClellan, though, had the war gone badly in 1864, that was his only shot. Yeah, if if, if there were no Grant, for well, Atlanta, or know. in if, Atlanta, or if Sherman yeah, taking yeah. Atlanta is a is a gift to the reelection campaign. Yeah, it is, but that only in many respects that only happened because Grant brought <laughs> Grant, Sherman in. Yeah. So you know, I'm, well, yeah. either way, though, I mean, it's still there are so many places where it still could have uh, could have gone badly. Now, Sherman being let loose in the South, there was no real uh, uh, organized, well trained opposition against him. And you know he he's moving through the countryside like crazy, you know. And, and it, Hood makes an attempt, but right? It, and and he's he's just outmatched. Yep. And so you know that was always going to end up being a gift. The only question was whether or not he was going to do it before the end of yeah, uh, the yeah, election the war. So, but it, it, things could have gone poorly for Grant, but if you know it, they didn't because Grant was, was good Grant, enough yeah. to just keep at it. Yeah. And even Lincoln so. says, "I begin to see it." Right, you're you're going to win. You're going to have success. I can tell. Yeah, they're, yeah. and they had an amazing relationship too. Uh, and uh, but Lincoln faced <coughs> enormous enormous difficulties. And and I have to recommend two movies uh, that you've seen. Both of them are entitled Lincoln. One of which was with uh, Sam Waterston. Yes. Uh, <coughs> and uh, and Mary Tyler Moore from the late '80s. That was an astound. Uh, maybe no, was, that was in the '90s. In the '90s, yeah. yeah. It was. Uh, it was something like it was. I think it may have even been a TV movie. Don't get quote me on that. Uh, but it was an amazingly good portrayal. Sam Waterston does a wonderful Lincoln. In fact, for uh, Ken Burns' Civil War, he voiced yeah. Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, he, in fact, if you ask Sam Waterston, that's why he very much admires him uh, and having uh, and he portrayed him very very well. And of course, the obvious one is Steven Spielberg's Lincoln with Daniel Day Lewis uh, and Sally Field uh, from 2012. Which is only a small snippet. Well, it's only largely centered on the team of rivals. That's exactly right. Which is what it was based on, uh, and it's just a few months in a, in the beginning of 1865 when the war is almost over. Uh, so you don't have the breadth that the other one has, which covers from his you know mm-hmm. his inauguration essentially, his coming into yeah. into Washington. That's why he grew a beard, by the way. You know, Lincoln beforehand did not have a beard, but he grows one because of the assassination threats on him. Coming into Washington, yeah, as if that uh, tall drink of water could be hidden by a beard. That's <laughs> correct, and uh, he's kind of recognizable. Yeah, so. very much so. Um, but that was his attempt, anyway. According to Alan Pinkerton, he's the one that suggested he do that. However, it uh, um, if you see the pictures, if you want to really understand Lincoln well, fortunately he was well photographed during his lifetime, not as much as we would like, but still was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you can see the the, the comparison of the picture from him uh, in 1861. Versus 1864. Oh, it's massive. Awesome. Uh, it's every massive. president ages 20 years in office. Very, very much I so. Mean, it's, it's and it was. Uh, it's amazing. Carl Sandburg called him the sad figure laughing, which I thought was a very astute observation. Uh, someone who who did his very best to try and live life uh, by the moral code he understood, recognizing he was in many respects out of his depth uh, in so many things, and he was not afraid. Unlike many egoists who assume the office of president, uh, Lincoln was not afraid to know and recognize what he didn't know. And he was able, in fact, he even resented some of the uh, attempts to strong arm him into political appointments and things like that. Uh, he would get new weapons that were sent to him to try for the, you know, because they wanted army contracts and stuff like this. Yeah. And then Lincoln just, he really didn't have a lot of patience for that. Uh, he says, you know, that's not what I do. You know, although he he did dabble with it, he, some. he tried a few and and you know, put stuff out there. But the myth making begins 
Um, we, we've talked about this a little bit because we talked about John Hay and, in the New American Century episode, but Hay and Nicolay, the secretaries, right. again, very young men. He, he kind of took both under his wing. Um, they would have been about the same age as what Edward and, and Robert. But right, they were a little older than Robert yeah. because Robert was he was in Harvard uh, for a while uh, while Lincoln was there, and he begged, 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 begged for a field commission. Of course, Lincoln and well Mary Todd <laughs> absolutely, frankly, not going <laughs> to nope, happen. Nope. Uh, yeah. But Lincoln eventually gives in to him uh, yeah. and and risks the wrath of, of his wife, unbelievably so. Well, he ends up on somebody's staff. So Correct. He's on Grant, he's on Grant's field. staff, yeah. and he's actually president of Appomattox. He's there. Uh, in the room when Lee surrenders to Grant, mm-hmm. uh, uh, so he he does he he, and Lincoln understood. He says Robert would tell him, it shows us in the movie with uh, Daniel Day Lewis. I can never face my friends; uh, they'll call me a coward the rest of my life. I don't want that. I shouldn't. Ha- I mean, you've got to find a way to let me do this. And Lincoln resists him for a long, long time because they've lost at this point two sons. Uh, Willie has died Willie's of dead. typhoid at the age of eleven in the White House. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, of course we've seen uh, the, the Lincoln family tomb uh, in in Springfield, uh, which if you ever get a chance to see that or the Lincoln Presidential Library, that was our, our day trip that we went up just a few months ago. And I don't know about you guys, but you know I'll never forget it. I think we can all. That was a great great trip. Yeah, it was, really it, was, amazing. It, was, it was it was really yeah they amazing. they start the myth making uh, pretty early on uh, with with a biography, but it's a biography that that Robert approved. Yeah, because, their access. Uh, eventually, Robert is the is the lone spokesman because Mary Mary Todd, you know, if she was nuts before her husband dies, she never recovers. And no, gets, she never recovers from the she's uh, she spends money after money on seances, trying to contact both Willie and Abe, and it just it never it never gets better. Their son Tad dies just a few years later, uh, and uh, as a, I think he was nineteen or something like that. So that you know she lives through that. Robert eventually has to commit her to an insane asylum, which she a lot. He took a lot of grief for that because a lot of people thought it was unfair. Um, only he can judge, I suppose. Robert himself went on to a fairly distinguished career uh, politically. After that, uh, he was on uh, he was in the cabinet of McKinley, and uh, I don't remember if he was in the Garfield. Uh, Administration or not, although he ironically he was present at the assassination of both Garfield and McKinley, of all things, hmm. which was very very weird <laughs> if, you th- if you think about that. Yeah, he was sort of in and out. He never really won any offices on his own, but he was sort was, of was, he was in and out of different uh, political positions. And yeah, things. he was. It was always appointed for him, uh, and it's because of who he was. Uh, and he lives, I think, until nineteen twenty or thereabouts in the twenties. Uh, and uh, ironically, Lincoln has no living descendants today. They've all passed on. Uh, they all came, so those that came from Robert, there were like three generations after that, and the final ones just died childless. There are no more Lincoln direct descendants available today, which is, a, which is you know, a sad fact, but as Stanton would say, you know, he belongs to the ages now. He belongs to all of us. Yeah. Uh, Robert lived to 1926. That's right. I know was in the 20s. was uh, minister to the United Kingdom for a bit and secretary of war for right. a bit. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. So he had a he had a distinguished career, and some of that was his father, uh, and, and because of who he was. Well, yes, he was smart. He traded on the name, yeah, no intentionally doubt. or not. It, it, right. It's obviously going to happen. Right. You know, you, you if you are the child of a, a president, yeah, a doors president. are going yeah. to be open. Even one who's not that beloved. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, even you know. Billy Carter got got the beer deal. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right about that one. I mean, he was a uh, he was a veteran and he was right. educated, yeah. and so he was qualified I mean, for these. He positions. was, but he, you know, and was competent. He was very. He was he was considered to be a very competent yeah. individual. Yeah, it, certainly, he probably rose a little higher because of the name, but he certainly was qualified. You're right, very much so. Final um, thoughts, folks. Uh, we, we talked about legacy. Well, we talked about president. I don't know. I uh, honestly, what's our time? We're forty-eight. Oh, see, we got plenty of time. Plenty of time. No, 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 no. no. We're, no, no we're, I'm serious. We're, we want to wrap this up, man. Because, well, the reason I say that I don't think we've done enough is, you know, we started a little bit at the end of the Code of Honor episode. Yes. But we haven't really. You know, all we've done is a biography of the man. You know, read no. a freaking book. 
yeah. if you want that. So we want to talk meaning, yeah. Yes, you want to talk meaning. That's okay. what snakes and otters is about. It's meaning. You know, pointless discussion of eternal questions. Indeed. And all that. Indeed. I mean, that, that meaning is that he's, he's a fundamental part of the American character. He stitched together several political notions and ideas into a coherent platform mm-hmm. that ties the promises of the Declaration and the structure of the Constitution into a whole, a meaningful whole, making both documents now a, a perfect union. Not about a perfect union, but it's certainly far better than it and, was. And a new one. Uh, no, Each but, one's incomplete without the other, but they yes. don't meet until Lincoln makes them meet. Yeah, there's truth to that. Yeah, but not that. then that was not without sacrifice, of course, and not yeah. without a great deal of blood, uh, <coughs> because many vested interests lost out. Well, and, we're, and we are still working at, at making that. That's correct. You know, fulfilling that promise of all men are created equal. And that really, I talked about this the last time, that really was politically his, his driving force. And that's the way he treated everybody. And, you know, God knows current politicians and, and people in power could learn a thing or two from Lincoln yes. in, in that respect, that, that we are all created equal. Just because you're a famous-ass surgeon or, you know, some uh, rich guy who bought his way into a, a political job or a... a or, 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 office, went, you know, or went into space on his own dime. Or so, went into space, yeah, that? you know. Well, you know, at least he spent his own money on it. That's you know, for it. It. You're no better than than me or, or, or any of us. As a matter of fact, in some of those cases, I would say you're less than, than the common man because you're wasting the potential that you have. Uh, you know, what, you can argue whether or not uh, spending all that money to shoot yourself into space is worthwhile. Well, uh, what's yeah. the legacy of it? Is it for yourself or is it for the betterment of humanity? Well, and see, that's the thing. There's, yeah, I mean, yeah. There, certainly we're very disdainful. We always have been here at Snakes Honors of people who use a platform that maybe they do or don't deserve to, you know, sell bikini pictures or whatever. It's like, you know, aim a little higher. If you have so many people listening to you, if you have the platform, well, let's use it for something more than going to space on the earth. No, I well, mean, no, like, he's talking Kardashian. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's okay. talking, you know, videos uh, of you being urinated on by, you know, a musician. Right. You know, let's, let's, or, well, or when you do turn your, your voice to some platform, you know, don't do it to virtue signal. That's right. You know, be genuine. Right. And Abe was genuine. He, he was. be genuine. And... You know, it's, we so we sum it up a lot with "Don't be a dick," right? Yeah. And that would have, Abe would have been like, "Yeah, right. come on, guys." Well, but also a he would also have agreed with Peter Parker: "With great power comes great responsibility." No, no. With great power must also come okay, great responsibility. Because there is a difference. There is with Ben because, Uncle Ben. Uh, That's Parker? true. Ben Parker. Oh yes, ben Uncle Parker. Ben. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, there is a difference between with, with great power comes great because that implies that you have great power and you have great responsibility, and you, you're taking care of both at the same time. That's not the case. The great power must also come great responsibility. That means when you have power, you must also take it upon yourself to be responsible in the use of it. It's not an automatic. That's why go. I think that's important to, to, to get that right. quote right. There you go. Uh, very well said, Robert. As no rights come without responsibilities. Life's Great. annoying backpack. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you are on fire today. Well, now that one is stolen. That was a no, that's down. okay. You know, you, you used it at the right moment. There you go. Uh, life's annoying backpack. Responsibility. Oh, wow. You didn't have to forge the sword in order to know how to use it well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, you know, Lincoln what is, is steel compared to the hand. hand. The wheels wheels is it. Oh, oh he has work. gone Melius <laughs> on us. Yes, yes, yes. Kind of yes. drifted off into all kinds of stuff, yeah. But, you know, but, you know the quotes come from people that we have... Talked yeah. about and admired, you know, yeah. so that, that's good. But Lincoln is is admirable. He is really great for the original title of this this week, which is Our Heroes. Yeah. Because he is one of the most admirable men that I think we could yeah. ever discuss. It is. It is. He was, for a long time, he was the North Star. I mean, the idea was to be, that's why the Republican Party had Lincoln dinners. Right. Uh, the Lincoln Day dinners was because... 
you know, whatever else you're doing, shake yourself, reorient towards Lincoln, and we'll be okay. Yeah, he was he was the marble man in many respects. You guys remember the poster I used to have, uh, Republicans with all these great quotes that... Yeah. Uh, so one of them was a Lincoln quote. I have not found it in, in my little uh, book here yet, uh, so I don't know if it's apocryphal, but I loved it. Uh, it was where Lincoln supposedly said, I am for the man and the dollar, but when in conflict, always the man. Yeah. And I think that's a great uh, great way. To, it was just one of the you know, few rare short quotes <laughs> that you yeah. can find for Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a good way to, yeah. to It's probably say. You know, something in the middle of some other you know 300-word quote, but it's... One of those principles that uh, I think all three of us uh, certainly yeah. uh, understand deeply and and uh, certainly uh, would ascribe to, in that you can't let the stuff in life, whether it's material goods or whatever, no. be more important than the people mm-hmm. in life. The human equation, because you know that whole "no man is an island" thing. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's been around because it's true. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, even Martin. Has to drive on roads paved by somebody else. <laughs> he as he's yelling at people to get off his damn lawn. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I you need still a recognize Martin only lane. That's what I mean. You need a Martin only lane. Oh, that's good. But I mean, you know, for all of your desire to be left alone, you're not talking about other people. You're talking about the intrusive hand of those who would wish to be our overlords. Define that ever how you will. Yeah. And define that ever how you I mean, like I've always said, you know, there there's two kinds of people. There are people who, whatever their political persuasion is, who feel like you must think the way they think. Yeah. And there are people who are like, I'm comfortable with you living your life. Go. Go. Leave me be. You go do your thing. Leave me alone. And that, that's, that's the two kind of people. And that's a, you know, a conflict of... Oh no, we can't have that. You must make the same decisions I make. Well, unfortunately, the latter making you must believe as I believe are in the ascendancy in yes. on both sides of the political aisle. Yes, very much. Ah, that's true. That's uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that's that, a you know, they have true. a lot in common, which uh, which it's I love true. saying and pointing out because I know it just pisses them all off. <laughs> right. Well, that, that uh, huge polarization that they think that the other side is the devil. You know, look in a mirror. Uh, right. There, there are multiple devils here. Well, uh, and you know. As I like to point out, uh, as I crib from uh, the former pastor, you know, saying that you you have it's my body, leave me alone, it's my choice, versus it's my money, leave me alone, leave me alone, how I spend it is my choice. It's two sides of the same damn coin. That's right. And I don't want to have anything to do with you. Everybody is liberal and everybody is conservative. What you like to espouse generally is what you're liberal about. I'm liberal about how I want to spend my money. I'm liberal about what I want to do with my body or my sexuality or whatever your particular whatever else issue about is. Yourself. Because we are a nation that desires to be free. That's part and parcel of the American character. And you certainly see it in Lincoln and his, in his father and his, his, his grandparents and, and, and so on back. That desire to be free, to make the most of themselves. When Thomas Lincoln moved every couple of years... It was always for something better. It wasn't because he had to necessarily. Right. He's not running from debts. No. He wasn't running from debts. He wasn't running from, uh, you know, from destitution to oh, I, maybe I can make it better over here. He was looking for something better, but he didn't have to leave where he went. So you know, maybe that's just that uh, also part and parcel of that American character that we are often not satisfied with what we have, and that can be a bad thing when taken to the extreme. Well, that's a human thing for many. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But it's also a good thing in that it is. we can strive to be better. To exactly. Strive, strive it's, to I'm, yes, I'm talking about the satisfaction with not having satisfaction <coughs> with, with what you have or appreciating it. Yeah. Because then the goal became, becomes the stuff. Yeah. And the status. Oh. Yeah. And oh. that's never a good thing. Well, it was Tennyson that said to strive to seek to find and not to yield. It's kind of the same thing. You yeah. Know, you're always wanting to be better. Uh, how that, you know, if you're doing that, uh, uh, what was it that Hemingway said? You're uh, you're not in competition. You're only in competition with your with your to make yourself better. That's not the that's not the one. It was a uh, uh, to uh, increase yourself. Uh, you're 
damn it, I can't get to pull the quote out, but we used it before. Yeah, you're close. That's yeah. pretty good, though. I think you got the nut of it. Is that kind of like <laughs> that episode of The Simpsons where Homer's uh, eating mayonnaise and, and uh, wine mixed together and Marge says, Homer, don't do that. You make yourself sick. And Homer says, that's a problem for future Homer. I'm glad I'm not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh boy! So you know that sense that who you are and who you want to be in the future—they're not necessarily the same person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, they're not. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be the same person I am now in five years. I don't want to be the same person I am now in next year or next week. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm going to be a little but, bit better. And I, this episode hopefully helps me keep Lincoln in mind when I think about what I want to do in my future. And what I want to be and how I want to think, maybe I'll, I'll, you know, maybe a little bit of Lincoln will pop in there. Oh, I got the nothing wrong with that. He's a hero. There's nothing Absolutely. noble in being superior to your fellow men. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Thank you very much. That All right, was what good I was job. To go yeah. for. So, let me give you one last quote. Oh, one yeah, last quote. So okay. Yeah, because well, yeah, that was a good pithy one, and this is one that. But, I it, but almost, it's Hemingway. We're doing Lincoln now. Yeah. So, uh, so ah, here we go. This is one that I almost used in Code of Honor. Okay. Uh, towering genius disdains a beaten path. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that is a, you could almost turn that into a, a, a one of our catchphrases. Yeah. Because that is, I mean, not that we are towering geniuses. Well, that's a road not taken. But it's a road not taken. It's, Robert it's Frost, being your own thing. Paving so. your own road, you know, cutting your own trail, how, whatever metaphor you want to being use. Being superior to your former self, that's all those A yeah. podcast all. nobody else is doing. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So, so has PJ responded yet? Uh, Grove Atlantic, uh, no, I haven't seen anything from. Well, PJ's come on, guys, publisher. get on it. You know, we so, we've got slots to. I don't fill. think we talked. We didn't tell the story yet, so I guess we no, better we tell it. No, yeah, we don't know that. Um, very recently, Otterites, uh, we went to the media inquiries page of Grove Atlantic, PGO Works publisher, and figuring, hey, we're media. That's right, we are. We would make an inquiry. <laughs> to see if we can talk to them. To the see man. if PJ would appear on a podcast. Now, uh, of course, we have no, uh, there's no way for us to pay an appearance fee, which I'm sure he probably charges a hefty one. Right. Um, but we, we did say we would be fawning and obsequious and... Uh, appropriately well, so. Appropriately so. Duly, duly so. Uh, obsequious and sycophantic. Yes, uh, in, and that we would be willing to share bourbon. That's right. Even if you know we do this over the phone, you know, thousands of miles apart, we'll ship them a bottle of bourbon. Oh, absolutely. So we right. can join it together. So, yeah, who knows? One day, maybe PJ or work will will make a that, guest that would, appearance yes. on the show. That would be amazing. That would that would be. Uh, I'm not sure I could go on after. I'm that. not sure you could. <laughs> that would be the highlight for you, man. <laughs> yeah, that's that really right. Good. I was going to say we might have to carry the ball on the yeah. speaking part because you'll just be. Do, 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 do. That might need defibrillating paddles yes, or something. Yes. Clear. That's right. So anyways, Francis, what's up next? You know, I haven't got a clue. No, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> uh, we're going back to pop culture next time. And we're going to do uh, vigilantes uh, in fiction. Yeah, vigilantism uh, in media. Yeah, uh, it's this uh, stuff that uh, I, I, I read a lot of that uh, as a young man, and so did so did Martin here. But it's it's more than just that. I mean, we've seen the movies. It's It, it became a thing right around the... The 60s and uh, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it really reached ascendancy. We've seen the movies. Rambo was a great movie that was sort of kind of that, but not really. The and first one, yes. The first one, that's right. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit that about was first that. First Blood, wasn't it? First, first Blood, first that's blood. right. Yes, uh, exactly. There's all sorts of this elsewhere. We're going to go deep with all that. Maybe you know about it, maybe you don't, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.